production. Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Nick of 2 Real Productions, and welcome to the first episode of 9-Bit Gaming. Lately, I've been thinking about an obscure little game. A little game by Enix called The Seventh Saga. It's known for its mediocre, but at the same time imaginative story, its timeless soundtrack, and its notorious difficulty in the West. I actually received this game mistakenly when my uncle intended to use a small, fledgling little website called eBay to get me Super Mario RPG Legend of Seven Stars. Unfortunately, the primitive search box gave him a different game with seven in the name. Never one to not play a game anyway, I put the game on later that night. But little did ten-year-old me realize my journey with this game would be a 23-year-long saga of its own. Seven Saga had a lot going for it. For example, I can't think of another RPG at the time where you could select up to seven main characters and have it make such a huge difference. I don't think such a thing was done in this fashion until Dragon Age Origins. But this is my own declaration without any fact checking so feel free to correct me in the comments. Each hero of choice has their strengths, their weaknesses, and their own perks within the story. There's Camille, the well-rounded, most boring, typical hero in the selection. Olvan, the dwarf powerhouse. Asuna, the squishy magic wielder. Ligis, the squishy magic user of black magic. And Lux, a big-ass robot. I am destructor! Of course, my choice of heroes was the only girl in their ranks. It was the 90s. Female heroes were rare in gaming at the time. Look at me, even back then, being the little feminist. My girl Asuna was named Liani, and my adventure began. Yes, perhaps I should mention this tiny little incredibly game-ruining flaw. It's relentlessly difficult. It is arguably the hardest JRPG in the Super NES library. For some reason, the balance in the Western release is way off from its Japanese counterpart, which is actually unusual because games at the time were often dumbed down for us noob Westerners, since Japanese considered us inferior at video games at the time, and to be honest, they were sort of right. Whether it was an oversight or an intentional FU, this game has been kicking my ass for almost 23 years. To be fair, it's not entirely the game's fault. I did choose the squishiest main character in the game, but screw choosing someone else. Liani is my choice of hero, and if I ever beat this game, I'm gonna do it with her. The graphics were good for the time, but by the time the Super NES's life came to an end, Final Fantasy VI, Chrono Trigger, and Lufia II blew it away. I do love the monster animations, and some of the boss monsters are terrifying to look at. Some would say the game hasn't aged well, but I think it looks fine enough. The NPCs are sort of bland to look at in comparison to its varied monsters though. The story from a theatric standpoint is pretty lacking. There isn't a whole lot of focus on character development, or even some notable characters that I can think of. However, the story from a narrative standpoint is actually surprisingly good. You're one of seven apprentices chosen by King Lamel to find the seven runes, ancient artifacts that grant the wielder special powers and abilities. Because each of the seven chosen by the king are motivated by their own individual reasons as to why they crave such power, they barely question why Lamel wants them to seek them out in the first place. Spoiler alert. Be careful, it's a trap! What's interesting in this game is the runes aren't just used as plot devices like Zelda's spiritual stones or Final Fantasy IV's crystals. 
they're actually items that have unlimited uses and are quite exploitable. The game's story doesn't focus on the main plot too much, instead giving us a series of standalone story arcs about how your character obtains each rune. Some of them are surprisingly good. One of the best story arcs in the game is when one of the apprentices get their hands on a rune that doubles their defenses, and they single-handedly use its power to decimate the military of an entire kingdom. What adds a little bit of replayability to this game is the rival that turns is randomly generated. Playing as Asuna, my traitor was Camille, and let me just say, seeing the character that in any other game would have been the hero turn out to be the first one corrupted by its power was pretty awesome. There's this reoccurring assassin called Pison that sucks at dying, and is basically put there to ensure that players never get too far under leveled. Because chances are, he will murder you the first couple of attempts before you level up to the point where you can defeat him. Anyway, in order to make your way through the merciless overworld and dungeons, the runes become part of your strategy to simply keep yourself alive. Throughout my game with Liani, I was the constant underdog, getting one hit KO'd by random critical hits and random encounters in the overworld, not even in dungeons. That wasn't until I got my hands on the star rune that doubles her defenses, so she can actually take a hit. What did I say earlier? The runes are exploitable? No, they are necessary. As you collect more runes throughout the game, you find yourself more and more reliant on them in order to get through the ever-growing strength of random encounters. By the time you collect the seventh ruin, you are so reliant on them that all your plans and strategies rely on their use. But in a brilliant, but at the same time, very aggravating turn of events, the king, that, you know, turns out to be the bad guy of course, destroys them and sends you back in time. So not only are you in a strange world and a strange time fighting the strongest baddies yet, but you are runeless. So, Asuna and Ovan, with no other alternatives, are forced to grit their teeth and stop Lamel with their own power. I thought from both a narrative and gameplay perspective, this was actually kind of brilliant. It's only when the runes are taken away from you that you realize just how much you've come to rely on them. <laughs> See? I keep going to the item box to use my runes. Damn it all. The gameplay has simple turn-based battles with a sort of random encounter system. It's not quite random since you can actually see the location of the baddies on a radar on the top left corner of your screen, but the movements are so random that they're very difficult to avoid anyway. The battles have the standard selections, attack, defend, item, magic, and escape. Defending actually has a lot of strategic benefits. When you defend, the damage you deal on your next turn is twice as powerful. More often than not, it's sometimes easier to just simply clobber foes as quickly as you can, especially when you're a glass cannon. About a quarter of the way through the game, you can recruit one of your fellow apprentices, so if you choose a glass cannon like my girl here, teaming her with a physically stronger ally really helps. But you gotta be careful when you talk to them. Sometimes they will turn on you and force you to fight. If you lose to them, they will take your runes. Usually I simply reset when that happens, because there is no way in hell I will ever be able to get that rune from that asshole that stole it. If I can't beat them with my runes, then why the hell does the game think that I can beat them in the rematch without it? Plus, once you defeat them, that's it. There goes any chance you have of recruiting them on your team in the future. <sighs> Did I mention this game is difficult? I guess I better elaborate a little more. Now, when I complain about this game's difficulty, I'm not meaning that it, this is always a good challenge. I admit, the satisfying feeling you get when you defeat a boss is second to none, but most of the time, the balance or lack thereof leaves you always struggling, leaving gamers feeling constantly frustrated or even deeming this game unplayable. The way you progress through the game goes like this. Wander into a new area, get your ass kicked, grind outside of town, save up for new weapons and armor, and slowly, 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 very, very slowly level up. Spend all your money on said armor and weapons, then go into the dungeon, die, go back and level grind some more, then go into the dungeon, level grind in there until you can start beating most encounters in less than two turns, and squeeze out a narrow victory against the boss. The boss battles are basically endurance rounds to see how many of your resources that you can use to get through it. If I waste too many of my rare finds on a failed attempt, I simply reset. 
Sure, you lose the XP that you gained on your way to the boss, but trust me, sometimes it's worth grinding outside of town a little more than losing your stuff. The game's grinding nature gets worse the closer you get to the end of the game, and this is usually around the time that I stopped playing. There isn't much for story in this area, no runes to collect, just travel around without fast travel, and fight baddies at the most inconvenient times. I didn't have to stand for this. There were far better games I could be playing. More renowned and balanced games. Final Fantasy VI, Mario RPG, Chrono Trigger. These games have balance, interesting stories, and great gameplay. Not that these games have no level grinding at all, but none of those compare to the amount of grinding you have to do just to survive traversing through town to town in Seventh Saga. I have no idea what happened, but this is a continuous problem. It's been 23 years and I still haven't been able to beat this game. You know what? I've had it. I have to beat this game. Every couple of years or so, this game keeps coming back into my life, reminding me that I still haven't beat it. I'm trucking through this time. Oh yeah, I'm gonna beat this game. The saga ends today. The fuck is he fuck? Alright, last boss. I got my runes back, but instead of being power-ups like before, I'm using them to neutralize his power and steal it. Which means in the past, I'm basically creating the power of the runes from the power I take from this asshole. Which means I'm creating the runes in the past for myself, so I can use them in the future to lead myself to this point in the past. Time travel. Fun. Anyway, DIE! Yeah! Booyah, Biatch! Uh. Okay. So after 23 years of dying constantly in this game... <laughs> I finally beat the final boss, and I die anyway. Who's the man? <laughs>